So today's guest is actually a really good friend of mine. He's a former professional boxer and WBC Cruiserweight World Champion. He's featured in Hollywood movies alongside the likes of Sylvester Stallone, Channel 4's SAS Who Dares Wins, and recently released his book, Everybody Has a Plan Until They Get Punched in the Face. He's a proud father, a family man, and runs an amazing campaign in Liverpool called Weapons Down, Gloves Up. Hope you enjoyed the podcast and thank you for joining me. So Tony Bellew, yeah, mate, thank you for being here. And welcome pleasure to the 3% podcast. Thanks for having me, mate. So we had a bit of a mad one because you obviously spend a fair bit of time together. We do. And um, this is the first time we've ever filmed a podcast and I'm going to apologise just because I can't speak properly. I was coaching <laughs> a load of kids yesterday and I've lost lost my voice. But we're here anyway, no excuses. Um, so yeah, pretty much the reason why I chose you and asked you to be the first person on my first ever podcast is because actually over the years of working in schools with kids, Mm. I've used you as an example pretty much every time okay. of how far you can get if you're willing to work hard uh, and basically push yourself and believe in yourself. I say a lot, don't I? And I've said it to you mm. openly, your superpower is your self-belief because basically you call yourself a fat kid from Wavertree and Definitely that. Probably the first person to admit maybe genetically, you know, you weren't the, uh, gifted. the most gifted, yeah? No. Oh. First of all, I'm, I'm honoured to be on this uh, you've been a, a good friend of mine for a long, long time. We've known each other since we were kids. Uh, yeah, and I didn't know I was the first one, to be honest. I thought you'd done a few now, so well done. Well, you, you're getting nervous, there. Eh? You're Keep getting nervous there. Yeah, don't, mate, don't be nervous. <clears throat> don't be nervous. It, the, these things are great, and the message that you're projecting out there is the most important thing, Mark. It really is. So, Well, to be honest, that's why I've chose you for the first one. Obviously, what you do with weapons down, gloves up, but... Yeah. To be honest, you've, you've always been an inspiration to me. And, and I know you find things like this hard to take. Sometimes you're always the first person to brush compliments off and stuff like that, which is obviously a testament to you being so down to earth. But at the same time, I think for people in Liverpool, especially young men, you're very relatable. And um, I think the way you come across and your honesty is, is important, especially these days, because there's not as much that about I'd like to think as there was. I, I try to be, but... It's mad. I, I still don't. I still can't get my head around. Like I've met some mega star people, some huge personalities and celebrities, and and most of them are all right. They're, they're normal, but I have met a few where they like to forget themselves, and and, and I can't get my head around with mm. how or why. Uh, you know what makes someone forget where they're from? What makes someone think there's something special or there's something great? I, I have no idea what it is, but yeah, I'm just I'm the exact same kid that I was when I walked into that Canny Farm gym off the 13 bus meet and was getting dragged all around the gym by Mark Kinney and, and everyone else in that gym. So, you know, yeah, good times. And yeah, I just I just don't see why anyone has to change or or, or your, your attitude or your demeanour or, or the way you talk to people or, or anything has to change because you've achieved something. All that you've done is achieve your own goals that you set for yourself and... I think you should give yourself a pat on the back for them achievements, but at the same time, it shouldn't change you, the way you are. So do you think success and likes and money and stuff like that changes somebody, or do you think it exposes a part of them which was was already there? It's something I've thought about a lot in the past. Money definitely changed how, how, how people treat me, 100%. It never changed how I treat people. Uh, money made me look at things different, 100%. Uh, and then as for the success, people, uh, lots of people, I, I know quite a lot of wealthy, rich people that I've got to know over these last 10, 15 years. Uh, and one thing I've, I've found more than anything is the richest and the people I've know, I've met and got to know over the years, they're the ones who, I don't know, it's hard to say what, what, I'm, what I want to say. Uh, some of them would like to experience fame, but they wouldn't want it. If, if it touched them, trust me, they wouldn't because I know what fame's like on a smaller level. See, I'm not someone like, I've got mates who are, who are extremely famous. Someone like Waza Wayne Rooney. Wayne's just globally famous. He's huge. I've been spent time with the likes of Sylvester Stallone. He's an icon in the movie industry. Uh, I couldn't, I wouldn't want their kind of fame. I'm, I'm, I'm famous on a point of level of, I'm from Liverpool, I'm a kid who, who everyone knows his face because he's been punching people in the face for, for the last 20 years and, and I was good at it. Uh, their fame is something like they can't walk out the front door. 
without someone intruding their privacy. And that's all this fame is, is an intrusion of your your own privacy and your private life. When it comes to the to the, the money side of things, uh, I'm still trying to figure that out, to be honest. Uh, I, I don't look at myself as being someone who's rich or who's got this or that. I look at myself as someone who's done all right. I'm in a bit of a privileged position to be able to help members of my family at times when they need help. And uh, and that's about it, to be honest. I just, everything else, <clears throat> me, my whole life was just set out to become WBC world champion. That, that's all my life was about. I was put on this planet to fight. I have no, no other objective in life before my kids come along was just to fight and win. That, okay. That's all I want to do. So something what you say a lot is I'm a product of my environment, just something I might lean into a little bit more further down, mm. or further through the podcast, but what was your environment? Or what's the environment which you believe created the person who you've become and in a way help you achieve all the things that you achieve through boxing and in life in general? So I'm one of four brothers. Uh, and as with any family of four boys, the elder ones, can't swear, can we? Yeah, you can say whatever you want, yeah. The elder ones knock fuck out <coughs> the younger ones. So me two elder ones, they, me two, Craig, oh, Craig and Wesley, Craig's my eldest brother, Wesley's me next one down. They wouldn't, they wouldn't beat me up, is it? but you know, you get a slap, you get kicked, you know, you get 10 bells, you give them lip, you get a slap, simple as that. Mm. So you'd have to learn to be able to handle yourself and cope once you're around older, young boys, older boys than yourself. I had the younger brother, our Liam, uh, so that's the first part of your environment growing up around five men, four men, my dad and uh, me three brothers, so four men and my mum. My dad leaves when I'm 10, so, and my elder brother at that stage is then gone. So the product of your environment then is at 10 years of age, I, the year before I go to senior school, I'm the second eldest in the house amongst the men because my eldest brother's gone, our Craig. Our Wesley is in senior school, coming towards the end, getting ready to do his A-levels, I think, or no. He's in senior school, our Wesley's four or five years older than me, so he's coming there. And I'm kind of like finding my way in the world, uh, me mates and me and my family. Uh, and, and I think growing up in that environment, I my mean, mum's working constantly, she's got two jobs. Uh, and yeah, working in that environment from that stage on, that's where, you know, that's my environment. I'm constantly thriving and fighting like me against the world. And, and that's how, that's my memories of growing up, yeah, mm. definitely. And then it doesn't help when your younger brother's gay, you know what I mean? And he's little and he's frail and and then you've got to fight his battles as well, which I've fought many, many times over. Yeah, I relate to that as well. Yeah. So the same younger brother, two years younger than you, loved giving everyone... Grief and being cheeky when we were kids and <laughs> kind of dad wasn't there, was with me or my mum. Mm. Same as yours, pretty much working two, three jobs. Mm. Found me brother giving everyone shit and next minute I'd be defending him and like, back like the man at the house, yeah, so I had to back him up and mm. got into more fights probably through him than I did. Yourself? So, myself, so I can definitely relate to that. But uh, the first time you walked into a boxing gym, then how did that happen? Mm. I know you started out kickboxing, didn't you? Yeah, I started kickboxing with a fella called Alfie Lewis. Uh, and I always had a talent with my hands. I could just always punch. My dad used to take me on pads in the yard when I was a kid. Uh, and my dad tells the story differently. My dad says, like, he took me for a run around Sefton Park. There's no way I ran two and a half miles without yeah. stopping. But that's his story. <clears throat> he ran two and a half miles without stopping. He wasn't even blowing. So then took him on the pads in the, gar in the yard, in the garden, I wish, uh, in the yard, and showed me the basics. I done kickboxing because I, I was quite overweight as a young kid. And uh, he, I think they just wanted me to trim down a little bit, but it didn't really work with the kickboxing. So after my dad goes, I'm going through a period of wanting to be this footballer for Everton Football Club. I just love playing football with the lads, my mates. So I'm playing for the school team. Uh, I play for the Sunday league team. I have a little goal for the team called Ash Celtic. Uh, I have I go for a season with a team called Ross Oak, but I never really played because they were all the players were just too good. They were all my mates, but they were just brilliant, yeah. all the players. So I just sat on the bench for the season. Uh, and then I get to about... 13, 14, and at this stage, I, every spare minute I get, I go to the gym with my dad. So if I'm not in school, I'm going to the gym with my dad in the morning. It was at the 051 gym. Uh, 
and they're doing boxing with a guy called Terry Quinn. Noel Corliss was in there with my dad. Uh, that used to work for my dad on the door. He was his good mate. And I'd do boxing training with them. And in that space of time of that 13, 14, 15 cycle, I was going to the gym with the likes of my dad. Uh, Terry Quinn was doing a bit of coaching with me. Uh, Stevie Bristol was in there, a professional boxer himself. And these would all be giving me tips. Noel Corliss, former professional boxer, Fort mm-hmm. Lennox Lewis, uh, beat John L. Gardner. John Tate, bloody hell, the people he beat an Olympic gold medalist there and the European champion. These were all giving me tips and little things and, and I loved boxing. I always watched it and studied it from afar, but I never thought I'd be good enough to do it. And the more I kept going to the gym, the more I kept practicing the things I'd been studying and the more I kept studying, the more I obsessed I became with it. And then by the time I got to 14, I thought, I don't reckon I'm going to be a footy player. <laughs> I just don't reckon it's going to work out, but you still keep playing and playing with your mates, streaming and hoping for the best. But at that age of 14, I think it, it got to a point where I thought, let's see how far I can push this boxing. Uh, and then I carried on training with Terry Quinn. I started doing things at the uh, Wave Chat Athletics, track training there, which I've never said that before. Uh, Noel Corliss was still helping me, giving me tips, taking me to the sand dunes, stuff like that, running. It was at 15 then. I went to a first gym I ever went to was Kirkdale ABC. When my dad dropped me off at the gym, uh, and I went into the gym, I went with little Peter Lynch. Went in the gym, done one session. I remember seeing Joey Ains go there. I don't know why I remember Joey being able to remember it. Doing one session, walking out the gym and leaving, never going back. It was it was off. I think it's a uh, what's that road called on the way to town? It's just Stanley. Stanley Road. Stanley Road. And it used to be in a community centre. go up the stairs and it used to be a boxing gym in there. It yeah. stunk as well. That's one of the things, first things I could think about. So I never went back. I just didn't feel like I vibe with it or anything like that. So from there, I left it for a few weeks. And on the, my dad was at the time was working on Garlands. He was running the, the night, the door on Garlands. And he had a fellow working with him called Mark Kinney. And uh, he said, get your lads, come to our gym. And I thought... So my dad says to me, listen, I'm working with a fella and I'll go with him. But I remember Peter saying he didn't like kick that out, so we went to Rotunda. So I went for another session to Rotunda. Uh, sorry, this time I went to Rotunda. Walked in the gym. It's a Jimmy Albertina. I met him, said hello. Put me on a bag. So Peter's punching one bag and I'm punching another bag. I think Peter had had bouts at this time uh, and I hadn't. I'd never boxed. Jimmy Albertina says to me, have you boxed? And I went, no. And he went, you have. How many bouts have you had? And I said, I have never boxed. He said, you don't have to bag like that when you haven't boxed. And I said, I'm just telling you I haven't boxed. Uh, and he went, all right. And I said, when, when can I fight? And he said, listen, lad, you don't ask me when you're going to fight. I tell you when you're going to fight. And I went, I know, yeah, but I'd just like to know when I can have a bout. And he went to me, yeah, about 12 to 18 months. And I went, all right, sound. Never went back. As soon as he said 12 to 18 months, I'm not waiting that long to punch someone's face in. So I'm not mm-hmm. going to train, train, train for nothing. So then finally, my third stop at a gym was Stockbridge ABC. Went into Mark Kinney. Uh, he took me on pads, watched me hit a bag. And I said to him, Mark, how quick can I box you? I'll have you about in four weeks. Six weeks later, I had my first bout. And then, then just never looked back. Mm. Uh, Mark had me sparring on my third session. Uh, I was flying. I was Everything was great. I loved it. It's probably around that time I first came, became aware of who you was. Yeah. So obviously I grew up or spent some of my my youth growing up on Canny Farm mm. or Stockbridge Village. I was mates with the likes of Gary and people like that. Yeah. Well obviously boxed in the same club. Gary, and, Timmy, Jonesy. Yeah. And um obviously Gary's a fucking really, really good friend of ours, isn't yeah. he? And uh, just through going to watch Gary and being around them, obviously I'd follow the boxing scene. Mm. And like you'd probably the first person I ever seen absolutely flatten <laughs> anyone. But I'd always laugh because I'd look and I'd think like I'd see these lads and at the time you probably what? 13, 14, 15. Yeah, the, the, they were a bit younger than me, <clears throat> Gary and Timmy and them. Yeah, you must have been, what, maybe 15, 14? Yeah, I was 15 at the time. Yeah, and uh, I just remember you'd always see, like, you'd be in one corner, they'd be in the other corner, and you just look like a baby compared to some of these, the lads who you'd be boxing. I know. And the next minute, they'd be asleep. <laughs> you'd be like that, giving everyone <laughs> loads. Crazy. I remember one time, like, it was off, um, it was off Belmont Road. Yeah. It was a little, like, social club down there. I can't remember what it was called. Oh. But I remember you flattening someone anyway. And fucking, there was a load of kids in there and all these ODs and all that. And you're running over to, on the ropes, fucking just giving them all loads. And I, think think at, I remember name. thinking he's fucking absolutely bonkers him. The, oh, the <laughs> name's on the tip of my tongue. 
Is it not the Montrose, is it? The Montrose. Is it the Montrose? The Montrose in Anfield. Yeah, I have... Uh, I had two fights in there for Stockbridge, um, one in Heat Waves and one in the Height and Suite. So I had four fights for Canny Farm. Yeah, I can definitely remember there being more than one here. Yeah. Not how true some the shows that I've been through, but I think the thing what always kind of got me attention was the fact that I'd look at them and a lot of them would look like big, you know. Yeah. And at that age, people turn into men, aren't me? I was having a, a, And you so actually look probably two years younger than what you're actually, actually, means, you're actually I was. I looked really young and I was undeveloped. You know what I mean? At 15, you fight at an age like it's a cadet age, so mm -hmm. 15 to 17. And I was 15, but I was on the really young side of 15. Like, I remember turning up to me first ever weighing at the height and suite. And Mark Kinney said, that's the kid you're boxing. And he had a hairy chest and a hairy face. I said, I haven't got a hair on me bollocks, never mind me face. Uh, and I was like, well, I can't fight him, he's a man. Uh, that's the first time I've ever been nervous. Mm. First time I was ever nervous for a fight and I just thought, this is not fair. I remember going to me, I'm telling me dad. <laughs> Somebody said to me, dad, I'm fighting him all day. Dad's got a hairy chest. Me dad said, what are you telling me for? Just get in, get, get rid of him, go and mm. do him. And that's, you know, I would quickly, quickly learned the fastest way to gain me dad's approval was fighting. So much stuck in my mind from what you'd said before was over. You know, you didn't think that you'd be any good at maybe boxing no. at the start. But then to look at you now and see how far you've come. And as I'll probably say numerous times during the podcast, for me, your superpower, you know, your strongest asset's always been your mind and your self-belief. Mm. So is that something where you can you believe you can learn or do you think it's something what you're born with? I just don't believe I'm that good at anything, to be honest. The reason I know I'm so good at boxing is because I gave it everything I possibly had. It, I just, I work so hard. Mark. So do you think you, you're able to get to the level of what you've got yeah. to through, through hard work and self-belief? Mm -hmm. Without a shadow of a doubt. I am not someone who's athletically gifted. I'm naturally not someone, talented. Yeah. I am not one of your naturally talented boys. Uh, I think one of the great assets that I had, that I do think that was gifted to me, that I didn't actually train was, I was never scared of a fight. You know, when you... You know, when you see people on like, oh, they shy away from a fight or I don't actually want to have a fight. I don't want to have a fight with anyone. I don't want a problem with anyone. But if you've got a problem, it's no problem. I'm happy to accommodate your problem. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't I don't want a problem, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I never had that fear of fights. Like, I remember as far back as being 13, uh, 13, about 12, 13, we were on a Picton Park. And a group of old lads took half football. Uh, and, and there was about six or seven of us, and they were bigger than us. Uh, and, and I and me mates just went, what are we going to do? And I said, I'll get it back, don't worry about it. I just walked straight over. Uh, and he was, he was bigger than me, and I was big as a kid. And I just walked over straight away, bang, straight on the chin. There you go, took me ball back, and his mates liked it. And my mates at that stage thought, oh, they'd never seen that side of me, because I, I was, I'm always... I'm soft, if anything. When I'm around people who I care about and I like, I, I'm just a big dope uh, and that was the first time he mates must have thought oh he's he's not soft I mean, he's, he's half handy you know what I mean so mm. I've just a confrontation's never frightened me like no man frightens me because you've got two arms two legs what can you do more than I can't do I mean besides tie me up and pull my ankles off or something like that which which Mark can actually do uh, then yeah but it's just nothing frightened me and I think that was so me it seems like your approach to fight them so obviously these are things what we spoke about again and, mm. uh, you know, part of why I think we, we were in a prison recently, weren't we? And a lot yeah. of the stuff what we can speak about in terms of fighting, mm. I know a lot of your strengths, natural strengths, I struggled with. So mm. nerves, for example, I really did not know how to deal with nerves mm. going into a fight. I had limited experience, but I felt a lot of pressure what I put on myself and from external as well, everyone else's expectations of me at the time. Mm. Did you ever feel anything like that or ever experience, you know, how did you handle your nerves and stuff like that going into competitions, especially later on once obviously you had so many people watching you and... See, straight away, the only reason you've struggled with nerves is because you care what other people think. My greatest thing for me was I was my own worst enemy. So nothing was ever good enough for me. So it didn't matter what anyone else said. I've always been that way. Like, I struggle with... with uh, plaudits I struggle with being given credits or I struggle being people tell you oh lad you're amazing you're great no I'm not I'm just a normal person I, so I struggle with that side of things but no one can paint a worse picture of me than I already have of my own self so 
no matter what you say or no matter how many much pressure people can heap on me, it's not as much as I put on myself. I expect, I don't go into any fight, I don't go into any situation or scenario without expecting to win in anything that I Yeah, do. I think in my sense, I used to put all that pressure on myself because I lived and breathed that I put so much, basically, mm. gave me life to fighting for 11 years. Mm. But then at the same time, similar to a lot of lads who've come from Liverpool mm. or athletes who've come from Liverpool, people kind of know where you're at level-wise and then mm. they start to expect a lot from me and I felt like at the time I was definitely, you know, I was getting all the, the people telling me how good I was and mm. to be honest, I was training with top level people all over the world mm. but I had very limited experience so like a lot of the stuff behind what I do now, I spent the last 10 years learning more about myself to understand basically what worked against me and what went, you know, what, what you know, reasons why I sabotaged a lot mm. during a fighting career. Now, the same as you, never turned a fight down in my life. Mm. Put me on a park with someone, I'd be a liar if it was to say, if, you know, if some big chest he wanted to fight with me tomorrow, mm. I'd, I'd be up for it and I'd, you yeah, know, I'd be looking forward to it. Yeah. yeah, it's great. I love sparring, I love all that side of things. But then when it comes to the actual competition, mm. I'd love all the training, the things which people hated, the torturing yourself through, you know, mm. carbons. There's not many places train harder than we did. Yeah. It's known for torturing you up until fights. But then when it actually came to being in the fight, mm. that's where I'd struggle because I'd be taking everything from the outside, everyone's pressures and stuff like that, into the competition. And I weren't able to enjoy the fight because I was taking all that, you know, everyone's expectations, mm. my own expectations and myself. And I definitely found that, that that affected me a lot. So did you never experience none of them you know anything like that i'm able to cut people off and cut and cut myself away from everything i mean it helps when you go away to camp and you're you're, you're, you're in solitude basically you're on your mm -hmm. own you're on your jack but you've done that you've been to the likes right, of brazil yeah. and you've done that so it's hard for me to to relate to what you're saying because i never gave anyone else a thought like i was so selfish i, I didn't care what anyone else thought uh and for you to, to have performed at the levels you have, it's amazing to think that you still was, was worried and, and not confident enough to just go, I don't care what anyone else thinks. I, I, it doesn't matter. All I have to do is win. Just And it doesn't matter. Mine was the win. opposite. No. I was going in for the perfect fight. So mine was like... Not going to get it. I had to, I was expect, I, I thought people expected me to be like Nemo at the Matrix. That's crazy. And then you've got, at the same time, I was coaching UFC fighters or pairing up uh, teammates with UFC fighters, cornering UFC fighters, you should say. Too much. I was saying in the States, at very top level mm. people. And then I come home and because obviously England was only a small place and we're talking when I was fighting MMA, it went what it is today. Mm. It was a lot less organised. There weren't as many gyms. Everyone kind of knew everyone in the UK. And a lot so less money. I'd struggle getting matchups. Well, the money's never been great until you get to a certain point. But mm. we'd struggle getting matchups. So with most of the people who I found myself fighting, I was expected to blast to just wipe them out yeah and mm. I didn't like that obviously I think the way your career's gone to look at you and some of the people who you fought even early on mm. you know you look at you if you look at two people in the ring you probably think he's going to get beat yeah and then the time. next minute the opponent to be asleep fast asleep it's mad where but I kind of had it the other way the everyone way expected down. me to be the, the you know I just, just the best way of, of explaining that is, is just don't care what people think uh, well, I'm a big you advocate. You put a post no. on mm -hmm. on social media a couple of days ago, and I was just glazing through and I seen it, and it was basically an empty room, and it was just put. These are the people that pay the bills at your house. Everyone's in this room. These are the mm -hmm. people that care about your family. These are the people that love your family more than you. All these people are in this room. The room's empty. It's <laughs> perfect. Yeah, but I get that now. That's something I've had to like. Yeah, but uh, completely changed my way of thinking. Through you know, I mm. say to you, don't I? The way I see it, I failed as a fighter. I'm not a failure. I actually yeah, see myself failed. as a success. Without a shadow but, of a doubt. But I failed at one aspect of my life. But that same thing which I failed at has helped me in every other part of my life ever since because I've actually owned the fact that I didn't reach my potential far from it because I didn't have the mental strength and the mental, I say mental fitness to match my physical fitness and technical ability as a fighter or a martial artist. So for people like this message for me is important because Obviously, I'm going now and preaching now, don't care what people think, mm. which is number one. Mm. Obviously, fulfill your potential. That 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 should be everyone's goal in, mm. you know, as a martial artist or aim to be the number one. Did you ever, see, did you see yourself for a long time being a world champion before you was actually the world champion? 
or has that came just over years of hard work and training and, and your confidence coming that I way? I always dream it and I always think I can be it. And I'll tell anyone who's around me that I'm going to be it. I, I just, I used to just keep telling everyone. Like I used to say, I'm going to fight Goodson Park one day. I'm going to be in the WBC title Goodson Park. And they'd be like, he's around the bend him. Mm. He's a bullshitter. He's a liar. He's full of nonsense. He's full of crap. No one can call me a bullshitter anymore because I've done everything I set out to do. Uh, and actually I've surpassed way over what I expected to do. I mean, fuck's sake, I've been in a Rocky movie. Uh, <laughs> I've been in a Rocky movie. I'm just <laughs> Even saying that seems yeah, crazy, it's not it? It's crazy. Uh, but yeah, I've been in a Rocky movie. I've won WBC World title. I've won a British Commonwealth European titles. I've won three ABA titles. In, in true honesty, Mark, I was over the moon winning an ABA title. Mark Kinney told Jimmy Albertine on the phone, I've just given you an ABA champion. And I think Jimmy said, it's a bit early for that, you know, lad. He went, mark my words, that lad's going to win, win an ABA title. Now, for people watching this, they'll think that, well, that's not a big deal. That was a huge deal. An ABA title is massive. I'm the best in the country. I was the best 91 kilo fighter in the country. I won the under 10 novices at 81 kilos. I won the under 20 novices at 81 kilos. And then three months later, I won the full ABAs at 91 kilos, 10 kilos heavier and against the best fights in the country. And I didn't just beat anyone for that ABA title. I beat the reigning and defending champion. His name is Mick O'Connell uh, from the Marines or the Navy, whatever he was in. Uh, so I'd, I'd never done anything easy. So as I kept progressing and, and, and I kept achieving little goals, goals that I set out to do, I thought, wow, I'm getting somewhere here. Then when I go professional, I'm not going to lie, to be honest, me, me goal with turning professional was... was my dream was obviously that WBC title, Goodison Park, it always was that. But then you'd have to be realistic. You'd have to go to yourself, right, I've got to set out a plan here and I've got to get to this level to get to that level. I can't be a world champion if I can't be a European champion. I can't be a European champion if I'm not a Commonwealth or a British champion. So you set your stand out, you set your stall out to go through them things. And what you're actually doing, whether you realise it or not, is setting goals. Mm -hmm. And working step. towards these goals and every time you hit a goal, then you obviously reach reaching further and going again, yeah. And that was the only thing that I was able to do was just keep my mind at it and stay focused. One thing I can give myself credit for is I maximised everything bit of potential that I had because I gave it everything I had. I, I like, I, I have no regrets. I don't look back and think, could, shoulda, woulda, coulda. I, I just think I, I gave it but everything. But as far as a fighter goes or an athlete mm. or anyone for that matter, that, that I know there's many different definitions of success, but mm. you know, in in that sense, you've got to say then, because that was one of my questions. What I was going to ask you is, do you think you could have gone any further than you did, or do you think you'd absolutely reach your full potential as as a boxer, as a fighter? Uh, I've got loads to go as a human being, as in a person, but as a fighter, but as a fighter, I fought the best that ever is in that Alexander Usyk. So no. Uh, I, I, I found me level. Me level was a, a rank under him. He, he's just, he was the best I ever faced. So, and I, I can, I'm happy with that. I can put my head on the pillow and go, you know what? I gave it everything. I reached the best. Do you know, I've beat former heavyweight champion of the world. I've beat the current cruiserweight champion of the world. Right now, I sparked him in three rounds. Uh, I've beat European champions. I've beat British champions. I've beat former world champions. So, yeah, I, I've, I've had a great go. And, as I kept ticking the boxes, like I remember thinking, going to training camp and doing something, going abroad to train, you know, staying in Lanzarote, living in New York, living in JC, all these places doing all the training. I thought, I've given everything I've got, I've left no stone unturned. I remember the first time I completed 12 rounds, thinking, I can't believe I've done 12 rounds. I thought I'd be absolutely blown out of, out of, mm. out of my backside, but it wasn't, it was easy uh, because I was so fit, I was so trained i was so well trained and so well prepared that it, it, i just done it so so easily but as i say it's everything comes down to how much i wanted it and how much i gave it and there's no point in doing anything in life if you're not going to give it everything you've got there really isn't there's no point in giving something 50 percent because you only get 50 percent of the result mm -hmm. people out there will look at me and think it's easy for you to say now now that you've been to top and now that you've done this and achieved or won that or done this you have no idea of the amount of sacrifice that people put in. And if you're willing to put sacrifice and dedication and time into anything, eventually you will reap the rewards. Did you visualise and see yourself achieving world titles and boxing? Because it's long before it happened. Did it something more? I dreamt of it. I dreamt of it many a time. Numerous times, that'd be my dream. 
I've woke up and I've actually woke up and been knocked out there. So thankfully that one didn't come through. Yeah. But, well, there's still time yet. Like, but I can't uh, see that happening. yeah, but I, I'm, for for the build up to the whole Macabre fight, I kept dreaming that he knocks me out. He knocks me out in the second round. Kept dreaming it and kept dreaming it. So you have no idea what was going through my mind when I get dropped in the first round. He snapped me nose. I was just like, "This can't really be happening." You better what was get up. feeling like when you? I know it's probably hard to describe in words, but when that actually came to fruition, when it happened, when I've when I knocked them out or when it gets announced, when you knocked them out, oh, I have no words to explain. Just relief. No, you think it's like I'm world champion. I feel great. I'm this and that. The best feeling of expert was relief because I'm no longer a bullshitter. I'm not. I'm not the bullshit everyone professes me to be. Tony Bellew's full of shit. Tony Bellew talks shit. Tony Bellew says he's going to do this. Tony Bellew says he's going to do that. Well, Tony Bellew's just done everything he said he'd do. He's won a British title, a Commonwealth title, a European title. And you know what? He's just won the world title at the one place where he's been talking nonsense out his whole life, Goodison Park. So, yeah. I do think, even. Yeah, mate. It just, <clears throat> that's the only way of explaining it. Just relief because... I validated everything that I said and promised people. No, I told everyone, me wife, me kids, me dad, me mum. Uh, and even then people looked at me. One thing about my wife is she never, ever, she always believed me. I'm not going to sit here and say she always believed in me, but she always believed when I told things. It's like the first day I met her. Well, not met her, I've known since I was nine, but when I started telling her, I'm, I'm a fighter, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this. Uh, I've done them things. Then when she gets pregnant, I said, trust me, it, it'll be all right. I'm going to, you're never going to have to work again. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this. I'm also going to do some unsavory stuff as well, so don't worry about that. Whatever it takes, I'm going to provide for us and we're going to survive. And then I got to a stage, remember being British and Commonwealth champion, uh, and I thought, we, we need to move house because the house is not big enough no more. We're in a three-bed terraced house. And I was skint, and I thought, I'll figure a way out. I'll get us out. I said, I promise you, I'll do it. Everything I promise her, I'll, I'll, I'll follow through and I'll do. But then I 100% couldn't have done it without her. So she's a massive factor of everything, whether it's my career, whether it's my actual fighting, whether it's my dedication. The reason I, I am the person I am is... is yeah, it's, it's the same, isn't it, behind every successful man? It's a strong woman, and yeah. I think in most cases it's right, isn't it? I already told myself she's a friend of mine, isn't she? Mm. And I can see that even from from the outside, you know. People say it, but it's mad how, how many people actually go through it and see it. When you see what I've been through with that, there's nothing that I haven't experienced that mm. I haven't been without her. So, yeah, from the age of meeting her when I was 18, she was 17. Uh, yeah, it was just... Very, very fortunate that I had it because if I didn't have a mate, I don't know where I'd be. As I say, when you're a kid growing up, and it would have been, yes, I would have dedicated myself to boxing, but there's no way I could have gone through what I've gone through. Not without hurting the kids, not a chance. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have persevered. I wouldn't have went through the pain and the torture. You know what it's like, Mark, of, of the pain and torture and the loneliness of training. Because it's all well and good having a team you know around you. I used to love that. Oh, it was hard. That's where, that's where like, it's different. I used to love... I used to spend three, four months in different countries on my own. I, I loved all that time mm. on my own to myself. See, that's the part I struggle with. But but I love the cutting weight. I love the, the torturous training the sessions. Bend. I look forward to them. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> I get nervous sometimes on a Tuesday morning going to Carbon, knowing what, what's, coming. Well, what's in store for us. But the worst part of it, which people used to hate, I fucking loved it. But then I used to, I used to struggle with the actual fight. Mm. Because yeah, I felt like I, I couldn't go in and enjoy because it, in, yeah. in a mad way, it meant so much to me. Yeah. And at the same time, I did care what everyone else, I, I cared about meeting everyone else's expectations. I had a lot pressure. of people around me. You know, I'd be selling mm. tons of tickets and it wouldn't be going out to sell tickets. I'd mm. have loads of people actually coming to the support I had from friends and people who, who I didn't even really know in Liverpool. Mm. It was amazing. I felt loved and I got a lot of attention off mm. and I won't lie. I like the attention. I think anyone who says that they don't like any of the attention crazy. as a fighter, mm. as a, I, don't, I don't think they'd be telling the truth. That's So you're, you're, 
Yeah. But I know a big part of why I struggled going in there because I honestly, as I say, I loved all the bits what people didn't mm. like. The seclusion, Evan, I, I like that. You've placed so much pressure on the performance. I didn't care about the performance. Just yeah. Me. Well, that's it in a nutshell. Because I understand that if I just keep winning, I'm important. I'm relevant. As long as I'm winning, I'm relevant. For you to place so much pressure. But for you to be able to do that when... I know there's no big money in boxing. I oh, know. You openly speak about how Skins. it's only been the last handful of fights where you've actually become life changing money. Yeah, basically you you financially stable and yeah, you know, free to a certain extent. So it's like to be going into them fights, knowing that you've got kids to feed and the missus to obviously to, mm. to, to keep your family happy, to keep them to keep a roof over their head, basically and keep them enclosed and fucking fed. And I, I think that's that's like it was very, very hard. Yeah, it's hard, yeah. Very, very, very hard. Uh, but I had no kids at the time. I weren't thinking about it. Like, mine was for me. Yeah. My fighting was for no one else, apart from so I had two kids. For myself. It would have <clears> been <throat> hard to have... Lo- it wouldn't have been as hard to lock myself away and just and torture myself and put me out if I was if I was in your position. But at the same time, could I have gone through that pain and, and sacrifice... Without the kids, no. I don't think I could have. I don't think I could have dedicated myself the way. I knew what I was doing it for. And them kids, I look at being a parent a lot differently than a lot of other parents. It's, it's, there's no two ways about it. I put these kids on the planet. They didn't have to be put here. I put them here. So they're my responsibility and I have to give them the best of everything I can give them. The only way I can give them the best of everything I can give them without going to jail is boxing. It's it's the only thing I can do because I've left. I've been expelled from school. I've, I'm thrown out. I've got no qualifications. What am I supposed to do to give these kids a good life and a good living? I've got nothing else. Mm. So I knew I had to literally give boxing up everything I possibly had, and that was the defining factor. So when I say I hate it being the lonely times, locked in the hotel room, the butchering training, the the weight cuts. Uh, yes, I did eat them, but. I always had them in my thoughts and that's what I miss. I miss just being at home. Like I, I missed being around them. I missed... My me, me, me greatest fear was was being a part-time dad, which which basically I've been for the for most of the lives. For the, for me, elder two boys, I've, I've only been there half the time. And even when well, I'm there... Being I'm a part-time like, dad, but you're not a part-time dad, yeah, by the no, way. Yeah, no, not anymore. Obviously, with the intention and the goal of becoming a world champion, and yeah. then giving them everything they could ever they could ever need or want, basically securing the futures. That's the, that was the plan. There's it? a hell of a lot different to being a part time dad because your kids are coming to have to see you. Oh no, over the table. I know. I get in, that. In a, you know, in a day, in a it, visiting room somewhere. Yeah, definitely. It, and and that's a massive factor in part. And, I, and I've gone through that side of going through the visiting room and seeing me own our fellas, stuff like that. So. I get that, and that's the reason why I stuck at boxing. That's the, that was the, the the driving force. So basically, you give there. yourself no choice. Yeah, I, that was one hundred percent. No option was there? There's no other option, and I've also I've also told that many people that I'm going to do this, that many things. I, I, See, I can't for me, not do them. When I, I I basically walked away from fighting at 27 in my physical prime, mm. and I just got a UFC contract. But when within a month's time, basically within a month, I'd got a UFC contract, but I had my first son, mm. and my love and my life had gone from fighting because I was obsessed with it mm. so when I used to live 20 minutes away from the gym I'd turn up in the morning I'd train for two and a half hours I'd do extra whenever I wanted to finish I'd fucking sleep on the mats I'd watch fighting on the mats instructionals of the fights I'd eat on the mats I'd train again in the afternoon I wouldn't even drive home because I was training that frequently mm. and I didn't have nothing else that was like you know I had Katie yeah. I had my missus apart from me all I had was fighting and, and, and that was it it's mad absolutely nothing else you know what I mean? It's mad. And now you can stay that dedicated. But at 27, I had MJ. Me, obviously, he was 11 now. Mm. And my life changed. You know, yourself having kids changes no, you, doesn't it? Yeah. When you speak know. about fighting being a, a selfish sport in, in some sense, I think you've got to put everything into yourself. Mm. But at the same time, I don't see it as being selfish. A lot of people have this thing over, like, you know, putting all your attention, working on yourself, doing all these things mm. for you. But it's not about you because you can't give everyone obviously your best if you don't feel your best yourself. I get that. So, and as a fighter, I'd be a week away from a fight mm. and I'd see someone making a mistake or doing something wrong in the gym. But I was coaching in the gym where I was fighting out of. So mm. I couldn't help go over 
and give someone else my attention, even though at that time my focus should have been more on my own mm-hmm. training. Yeah. So I look back now and I, I hold my hands up and say, yeah, I failed as a martial artist because mm-hmm. it did not reach my potential. Mm-hmm. That's fact. No one can argue with me over that. But at the same time, the lessons I've learned from that and from failing that part of my life has taught me so much in the sense that I'm not prepared to fail at anything ever mm-hmm. again. That hasn't happened overnight. That's come through a lot of work it's on myself and studying and learning exactly where I went wrong. But then to see someone, and I've watched you over the last 10, 11 years, well, I've watched you for a long time. I've watched you do things and think in certain ways and understood that I didn't think in the same way. Mm. And you've done a lot of these things, in my opinion, without realising you were actually doing them because they were who you are. Like the self-belief in these certain things, mm. flattening people at 14 years of age. That's like, you know, these, some of them you could say are natural gifts. Yeah. And I do believe that the, the belief in a lot of the things which you carried and took you so far, I, I do see them as, I know I'm not taking anything away from the work that you've put in. There's absolutely no question over mm. how hard you've worked now, which you deserve everything what you've got now. But to have that self-belief, I think now the message I'm trying to put across to people, and again, the reason why you're the first person on here is because I understand that your self-belief governs everything, controls mm. everything. Your life is basically a reflection of who you believe yourself to be. And you're saying that yourself through the dreams that you've had over winning the world titles. Mm. Basically everything what you've done has come from you having that insane belief and basically having no other option apart from, you know, achieving these these things. And I think that, that that's obviously, it's amazing um, to see. And I think so many people in this, I'm in schools now, which you know, similar to yourself, are working mm. with young kids and teenagers and they've got no belief. No. They're just suppressed and they, they, they are products of their environment. So like, you know, I think we're both very fortunate to be in the position we're in today based on we come from a lot of the same environments as these kids who were working with and who were around. Like for the likes of them, what would your advice be to a kid who's 13 to 15 trying to figure out where he is, who he is and leaving, you know, not far off leaving school? And- it's a difficult age to be at 13 to 15 mm-hmm. because, you know, you're going through, how you mature, you've gone through a certain age you're going from a boy to a man. Uh, and then you're also, at that age, well, from where I grew up in, at that age, you start coming across certain substances, alcohol, drugs, things like that. And you see certain things that you, that shock you, take you back. And then you become, you become immune to them and accustomed to them. It just depends on which path you want to take when you first come across them. What I would say is, don't ever give up and don't ever stop believing in yourself. Whatever goal it is, you set out set it out and stick to it you know that that's that's all would, would you agree that you don't have to know exactly how you're gonna get there or how you're gonna yeah. you're gonna do it you figure it just out just a case of having, having the image or you know the, the, vision. the goal in your mind the vision yeah have the vision and understand it's gonna take a lot of hard work and and i always say how much do you really want it because there's some people who want it there's loads of people who want it but do you really want it that much that you're willing to sacrifice your Saturday night out with Well, I know mates? one of the mistakes I made was I was not precise in the sense I never said I am going to be the world champion. I am never going to be the best fighter okay. on the planet at 77 kilos or at my weight at the time. I My goal was to be a paid fighter and earn a living out of doing something that I love. Okay. For me, it, it, I never see myself as being the best pound for pound fighter or my goal was to just earn a living doing something what I loved but I weren't in that position and you know yourself you know you're going to have to get to a certain level especially at that time in the likes of the UFC and even today in boxing before you're earning enough money no. to provide for family and live a, a decent um, standard of living basically you know you've got to you've got to have had so many fights and be you know selling you know basically selling out arenas and established established yeah fight with, you know fighting for titles and stuff like that so I think for me getting to 27 mm. and obviously still being so early in my career, um, I speak a lot about not really understanding how that worked and trying to figure that out. I was going along, taking so much pressure into fights where I didn't actually enjoy being in the competition in the fight because mm. I just felt, as like you say, a sense of relief. Afterwards, mm. my sense of relief afterwards was that I'd, I'd won. It was never, I'm a step closer to becoming a world mm. champion. It was always like... I've just won. I've won, yeah. I've won now. I'm straight back into the gym, onto the next one. And it was to try and create, as I say, a life where 
I was just earning enough money to live in a way which weren't going to get me in any trouble. Mm. I had a son. I didn't want to obviously spend any time away from my son. So it was like, you know, you're doing whatever you've got to do mm. based on the fact we are products of our environment. So we say, of course, to pay your bills and survive. But at the same time, you know, you've got visions and, and, and goals. goals and aspirations. Yeah. So it's like, for me, it was, it was a hard decision to walk away. Walk away. I had to spend two, three years explaining to people. People thought it was nuts. Like, you've got a UFC contract, you're 27. And I was a good fighter. Mm. You know, what are you doing? Um, and it was hard. It was a hard uh, time in my life. I felt lost. But the one thing I knew, I could always earn money. Mm. From being a kid, I was always like entrepreneurial. There was different things I could do. Mm. You know, I always seen, it was, it was, it weren't such a hard choice in the sense that I knew if I was to come away from fighting, mm. then I'd be successful in providing and, starting a business or doing whatever I needed to do basically to put food on the table mm. so I think for you uh, obviously you know based on where you were from and what you believed yeah there was no other option apart from boxing no I just gave it everything and as I said I told that many people that I was going to do it I'd heap that much pressure on myself I had to follow through so if I say I'm going to fight someone I'm going to fight you even no you know no matter what Uh I backed myself into that's a, a, a large part of me. I backed myself into a corner where there's no other way out. Get in the ring and perform. Uh, you know, you look what how I created the David A scenario. I, I requested that he was there to commentate on the fight. That was as good mate BJ Flores who I fought. It, it was no, it was no coincidence. David A was commentating ringside. It was no coincidence that I fought as a really good friend BJ Flores in my first defense of my WBC title. Mm. I knew exactly what I was doing. There's no such thing as coincidence when I'm involved. Uh, There's no such thing as coincidence. Full stop. But I get it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so I, these things you created, all these yeah, things. I create. I create the hype, and then what do I do? Like David A turned up at that arena that night. No one in a million years thought, I'm going to fight David A next after BJ Flores. No one sees it coming. I know David wants big money fights. I know I can generate... So this plan? Yeah. One was, in my mind, not to no one else, didn't tell Eddie in. I definitely didn't tell David A. So when David's there and he's giving it, I'm, 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 the minute I drop BJ Flores for the first time, bear in mind, BJ Flores is someone who has never been stopped, is for, for two world titles, losing narrow decisions, uh, and I drop him for the first time. He goes down for the first time in his career against me. So he's on his, on, his, on the floor. And I walk straight over to the country and say, there, you're next. I'm going to smash your face in. The fight's still going on. Referee's counting. He gets up, bang, 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 put BJ Flores down again. I'm over to the side, David. They're going, I'm telling you now, you are fucking next. At this moment in time, the sky comes. So everyone's going nuts. What's going on? He's, he's standing, David, he's in a fight with BJ Flores. Uh, I start training with BJ Flores and I'm going hell for leather again in the end I get rid of him he's never been knocked out for I've done him in three rounds then I walk over to David I kick a toe roll man as hard as I can <laughs> at this at this now in mind everyone's up on the feet going what is going on here what's he doing I then jump out the ring knowing full well I'm not going to get him and hopefully I don't get him because if I do get near him I've got a glove on and he's got a clean fist it's only going to be one winner mate if he hits me on the gym with that fist I know that but I also know that the security is probably going to get in the way. Well, I'm hoping they get in the way because if they don't, I'm going to have to, once again, I've heaped that much pressure on myself. I've put myself in a scenario is I'm going to be boxing with this fella at ringside if the security don't get in the way. I'm just hoping they do the job. They do do the job. They get in the way. And before you know it, it lights the touch paper to everything I've ever dreamed because everything that I need to do. Once I became world champion, I'd, I've achieved my lifelong goals. I have no more goals. She asked me on the Monday morning, I fought for the world title on a Sunday, bank holiday Sunday, 29th of May, 2016, at Goodison Park. I wake up on the Monday morning. I've got a WBC belt in my kitchen. It's sitting there. I've got the two gloves next to this. I've took a picture of it on my phone. I always keep it there. And that's what I woke up to when I come down to the kitchen because I didn't really sleep. And she says to me, it's over now, isn't it? You know, you've done, there's nothing left for you to do. You've been British combat, the European... <clears throat> I'm world champion. I said, Gail, we're so far away from financial security. Like, she, me and missus doesn't know about any of the finances. She doesn't know about the money in the bank or bills or whatever. She knows to, she like, she pays the gas and lecky. <laughs> so that, that, that's about as far as it goes. 
And then she, I says to her, we're so far away from financial security. We don't even own this house we're living in. I've got a mortgage on this house we're living in now. All my life and career savings were in my house in, uh, in where I was living at the time in Orton. And I said, we, we haven't got the money. She went, what do you mean? I said, I've got to keep fighting. I've got to secure us financially through what I'm doing now. And I said, but one thing I promise you is from here on in, my career is about money. It's no longer about my selfish need to want to be a world champion. It's no longer about that driving factor and force that I've got to win this. I've got, it's all about that. Because that's all I was focused on. I was just like, it didn't matter. It never came. Boxing came first. It, nothing sidetracked me. Nothing got in the way. That was all that mattered. So when I become world champion, it's like now the now the goal is money. And that's why I targeted mm. David Day. And I created that, made it happen. So when I create, when I targeted David, uh, that was a plan I, I thought up my own mind. No one else needed to tell me. People like Eddie M was quite adamant and honest. He said, I think you're going to lose. He's an heavyweight. And I was like, you'll see. I know for a fact I'll beat him. Because I have I've, I just know I'll beat him. I can make him miss. I've got a better boxing brain. He's a far better athlete. He's a far better boxer than me. I've got no problem in saying that. But his boxing brain's never going to outthink mine. Not a chance. There's not. There's only one man who's ever had a better boxer than me who I've ever faced. I, I might have. I might have lost a fight because a guy's stronger than me, or I might have lost a fight because a guy's, you know, faster than me or, or better at stamina tank than me. Which I don't even ever think I've lost because of it's, it's stamina. To be fair, uh, I got tired against Deuce because he was that bleeding good, but no one could outthink me. The only person who was able to help think me was Alexander Usyk. Mm -hmm. The only he, he was, he was another level ahead of me. There's obviously another fucking gateway where, course, they, yeah. where they let people in, but uh, my boxing brain was never ever going to be questioned, and I knew David they couldn't outthink me. Okay, and I'm going to go back to them. Um, you winning the world title at Condition. Yeah. I know that you like to keep family totally separate from fighting. Yeah, and again, it's something I can relate to. Never let me mum. I didn't have any kids at the time. Mm. Didn't like me mum going. Didn't like me missus going. Mm. I felt like fighting. Obviously, I see that as a sport. No, you still see it. It's a fight. Obviously, it's brutal. Mixed martial arts and oh, yeah. boxing. It's brutal. You can get hurt. Oh. But I never, ever thought about that side. But I seen it purely as a sport. My approach it was always as as an athlete in a sporting perspective. It was never as, I never seen it as a fight like, like the way you see it, mm. basically. Um, I know you see it as an athlete and everything else, but at the end of the day, it's a fight, isn't it? When you get in there, it's a fight and you want to fucking hurt someone. Without a shadow Basically, hurt someone I just wanted to, to win. win. That was it. Um, I understood. I always understood how dangerous it can be. But on the night before your fight, so going back to something I read in your book, okay. something happened before the fight, which I know definitely will have affected you in some way. Can you think what it is? The night before the world title fight? No, right before the fight. The three hours before oh, the stadium. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, bloody hell, yeah, that sticks with me. Bloody hell. Seeing Corey absolutely breaks my heart. Mm. Yeah. I don't think... Even now, I kind of... I'm happy he was there to experience it and I look back at the pictures and it made up he was there, but I still don't think... Still think I was wrong for bringing him. Mm. Still think I was wrong. And, and, and I knew I was wrong when I broke down, crying. I knew I was wrong because... Just seeing his little face, he shouldn't have been there. Ten years old. Oh. That was before the fight, wasn't it? That was yeah. Two hours doing a lap of the arena. Three hours before the fight, I come out of the Goodison Park Tunnel, and uh, I'm standing on top of the stairs, and I just heard Dad, and I thought, can't be him. There's no way that can be him because I told her, I definitely told her, I can't see him at the boxing. I do not mm. want to see him there. And she said she wouldn't get there till eight nine o'clock. She let him go with me nephew. And, and I thought, it can't be him. He's dad, dad, dad. And he's turned around and seen him. And he, he'll not, I hope it doesn't stick in his mind, but I didn't even acknowledge him. I looked at his face, seen it was him, and just ran down the tunnel. And then, yeah, I was just in tears. Couldn't believe I'd seen him. Just, yeah. Shouldn't have had him there, to be fair, but he experienced it. He's there to see his dad become world yeah, champion. Yeah, totally. It was a blessing at the, in the end, wasn't it? But obviously, it is, but mate, it could have and been. And again, a testament to yourself, because I know how strongly you feel about that. Yeah. To, to I just never have to believed. go through that just before you're fighting on. Oh, mate. I know that would have meant a lot to you. So. Oh, that was just, I'm, it's crazy that I even done it, but um, yeah. A couple of other things I had in my mind over speaking to you about was I remember we were in a car on the way to see Gary and you said over um, 
I was having a conversation about my own son and some of my expectations and things like that based mm -hmm. on who I am and, you know, the way yeah. I was in the past. I was a perfectionist, which which can be a Strong. good thing in some in some respect, but at the same time, it, it can it can be very negative as well. Yes, definitely. Especially when you're expecting similar from other people close to you. And we had a conversation, which really helped me a lot. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm grateful to you saying over, Jimmy, Albertine used to make you do twice as many uh, push-ups and twice as much running yeah. when you got to the thunder. Yeah. So I was just going to touch a little bit on your attitude at the time. Oh, amazing. Obviously, you know, we, we, we speak about your hard work and you're the first to say, fucking get after me balls off. Yeah. No one worked harder than me, but cutting corners, what's your opinion on? Did you ever cut corners on <laughs> training? Or? I, was, I was never allowed. I tried. I, I definitely tried in the early days as an amateur. Uh, I do, when I'm alone, I would always do the work because I would go home and I would study. I would watch me Roy Jones Jr. tapes. I would watch Bernard Hopkins. I would study Riddick Bow. I would watch Larry Holmes. Uh, and then I would go out running after watching them. But when it comes to the gym, uh, so with Mark Kenny, he, he basically blew me up. Horrible man. I hated him when I first went to <laughs> some little up. I thought Mark Kenny blew me up. So because Kenny Farm was so far away from my home, I've always traveled to boxing gyms. I always wanted to be in the best environments. So, where would you to Canny Farm? There's some going. Uh, you get the 60 bus to the 60 bus to West Derby by the Jolly Miller. Walk over from the Jolly Miller, get the 13 or the 12 into Canny Farm. I still remember the bus route. Uh, and the bus route to Rotunda was either the 86 up Smith Down Road or walk up Smith Down Road to Lodge Lane. And then from Lodge Lane, get the 26 or the 27 right through to, to uh, Scotland Road to Rotunda. Uh, I never used to turn up to Canny Farm to do the runs because it'd be too far and I'd go Mark I'll just be here for the boxing gyms I'll be here Monday, Wednesday, Friday and he'd like me to come on a Tuesday or whatever day they'd do the run and I'd go Mark but I don't need to you know I'll just do the run from home and he used to let me slide and get away with it and slowly but surely I'd go like Mark I don't need to be doing these circuits you know I'm every week every week don't really do circuits and I think he thought because I'm such a talented kid and because I am so good he half let some of it slide whereas the likes of Jonesy and, and Gary and, and Timmy and all them they'd be grafting themselves off on the mat and I'd be like, I'm just getting a shout I've got to get the bus home and I've got to go. I'm, I'm living miles away from here. So that kind of traveled a little bit with me. And then when I went to Rotunda, as I said, Mark, can he phone to me? I've just gave you an ABA champion. He will be an ABA champion. He said, but what I'll tell you is anything you ask that lad to do with boxing gloves on, he'll do and he'll be amazing at when he's doing it. He said, but he hates running and he hates circuits. And, and Jimmy, I've seen it just, he said to me, let me say what he said, lad. He said, you hate running and you hate circuits. He said, but you love punching or you love hitting anyone or you love doing pads. And I went, I don't know what he's on about, Jimmy. I said, I haven't got a clue. And I was biting me bum inside. And he went, uh, so you're going to run with the featherweights and the flyweights and you're going to run twice as much and you're going to do twice as many circuits. And I just thought, oh, for fuck's sake. And he paid you up with Declan, oh, Declan O'Rourke. Declan O'Rourke, mate, was like unbelievably gifted mm. on a mat. Like Declan O'Rourke could do press-ups and he would do them, every one would be perfect. And if you weren't doing them perfect, he'd be screaming and shouting. Like Declan was, even though he's a he's a bit younger than me, he was like the the mascot of where the club was going. He was a national champion, he was brilliant. Then there was Paul Smith. Paul was a little year older than me. And when I went to Rotunda, Paul was in the England squad for the Commonwealth Games and he was getting ready to go professional. So he went pro after the Commonwealth Games uh, and that's the period I went there before, just before he went to the Commonwealth Games. So we had the likes of, so Stephen Smith and Joe Selkirk were the two young, they were babies, but they were super talented babies. They were unbelievably gifted mm. and good. So Joe McNally and Declan O'Rourke, they were the ones who were a few years younger than me, but they were in and amongst that bracket of boxing and, and they'd done everything right, the way they'd run, the way they'd train. And then a few years older than me was a kid called Mick Whitty and Paul Keir. Yeah. And they'd be training like animals. I just, when I went to that gym, everything went up a notch. That's the best way of saying it. And me training, me levels of training, I basically got found out because I never, I never cut corners with training. I was, and I was, as I said, me, my ability to adjust and adapt when it came to the boxing. It's because a lot of people get nervous, even for sparring. Lads used to get nervous in the gym. I love sparring. Why would I be nervous? Oh, I'm going to show off what I've been practicing. I would study fighters that much. Like I would go to the gym some days and I would go, right, I'm just going to 
practice what I've seen Roy Jones do all day in the sparring match, in the sparring partner. And I'm not going to box the way this coach wants me to box. I'm going to, I'm going to spar him. I'm going to be Roy Jones. Today. Exactly. That's <laughs> what I do. Like I, my second, I had one fight for Canny Farm in the, in the original colours. My first ever fight right and sweet, I wore white and purple. And I thought, this is the, <laughs> this is a tart kit, basically. I thought, <laughs> I might as well put a bit of pop socks on with this. <laughs> uh, so I thought, I'm not boxing this kid again. My second fight for uh, for Stockbridge, I wore silver and black shorts. And I wore silver and black shorts because that's the shorts the colour Roy Jones Jr. wore against Richard Hall in his fight. And that's what I got my dad to get me them. Uh, the grand shorts, I'll say, uh, silver and black. And I got them from Pro-Am. Yeah, uh, Pro-Am, yeah. In, in St. Helens, just there. I think, no, in, but I remember in at Prescott. that time that it's under, if me anyone spoke about Oh, there'll probably be other boxing clubs in Liverpool which may oh, not agree with what I'm about to say but that was the main oh, the main gym all the best fighters really were coming out of there at Thunder weren't they after you I see had, that you go to the shows it was like after I had four fights for Canny Farm <coughs> in my fourth fight I got disqualified mm. uh, it was in Eat Waves Bats I fought a fellow called James Boyd it was my fourth amateur fight and he went on and won the ABAs that year and he mm. spat at me so I just butted him right in the face as hard as I could and I said, get out get a maniac and I was like fuck off who cares and Mark Kinney said, you were winning that fight. I, I, I don't think I was. I think it was just one of them dead close, gritty fights. But yeah, had a butt of them as hard as I could in the face after he spat at me. Uh, Going back to Canny Farm, just mm. while we're here. Obviously, we've got mutual mates, haven't we? Yeah. And uh, remember me phoning you when you were in the car that time? I think you was with Rachel and the kids in the car. That makes sense. And I've been on the phone them. to Gary, hadn't I? And he'd been telling me this story, so basically. Oh, yeah. <laughs> how, the, uh, how the story went was, Tony was a... Uh, a few lads who I know, local lads, friends of mine, who boxed at the same club at the time as Tony. They were all in the gym. They were in, sorry, they were in the uh, leisure centre, weren't they, Waves? We were in Eat Waves. And um, they were only like brand new. Basically, it was the, I think it might have been the, the first or the second fight. The first fight it was. My second. And it was Tony's second. And they sitting in the, uh, the warm-up room and they get the gloves. So they put the gloves on. And they're like, punching each other's hand. They're like, oh my God, put that on. Like, and one of the lads passes a glove to the other one. He's like, oh, imagine getting it with that. And I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like tapping each other's chins like, oh my God. Imagine getting it with that. There's fucking no padding in them. And the next minute, some some big dope walks in. <laughs> as he called him, you know, Like that with a pair of beats on with his earphones on. What's happening, boys? Just picks a glove up. <laughs> picks one of the gloves up. What do you just add on? Puts it on and just goes, fucking hell, someone's getting it tonight. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Watch what happens when I hit this guy with these gloves on. And, yeah. and I think that, that that's pretty much the fans. And you know what? The difference between like, you know, you could say fucking crazy or, you know, if there's a reason why I think you've achieved a lot of things, which obviously not everyone, that not everyone night, does, do you know what I mean? Stories night, like that. That story, that night. Of Priceless, yeah. And I don't remember doing that, but they tell you that. But what I do remember is the person I fought. They tell it better than I do, though. Trust me, Gary. <laughs> so it's as Gary, I've done Gary that, that's exactly what I do. I go wait till I clip this kid with these on. <laughs> and then I walked out that night against a guy called Ryan Connolly. And I, I knocked him spark out in 29 seconds. Yeah. Because I come out right hand over the top, bang, and he, he hit the floor heavy. And I was just walking around. I am the best fighter you should ever gonna I am amazing. And Gary always tells me, he said, <laughs> we went out that night after it and we were walking around the estate in Canny Farm. Did you that, that industrial estate that was by, uh, yeah. by Eat Waves? I know exactly what you mean, yeah. And he said, he said, and they were with a gang of girls. He said, no, there's the gang of girls going on about that bell you how good's in all that. He said, lad, you stole our thunder. He was absolutely yeah, devil. <laughs> and I didn't ever see that side. Like, I weren't bothered about nothing like that. Then it was just about, I'm, I've got to knock him out. Yeah. Like, I, I have to get there. I think that's a boss story. Do you know what I mean? I'll never get bored of telling people that. But it's I'm going to go back to Jimmy Albertina then. Yeah. So obviously, Jimmy, massive role model mm. for not just you. The, the amount of lads I hear come from that gym, you speak so highly. Yeah. Of Jimmy, I only ever seen him a couple of times to be honest. Mm, he was great. But from obviously the, the people who are known the way they talk about him, I know he must have had a massive, massive influence over the, the you know the the many years of all become the lots, days that the lads in that gym from that era. So no, no, how no, important do you think it is to have role models like him, especially for kids nowadays with with you know the environment and the way we're growing up now? I'll never forget him, uh, and none of us who have come from that gym we should ever forget him. Uh, he was the one 
I, I always, I loved Mark Kenny. Mark Kenny was great, but it wasn't until I met Jimmy that I really did believe in myself because I knew if I could do his training and keep up with, with his regime, I could keep up with anyone in any way. Uh, amateur coaches are the best people in the world because these are fellows who aren't doing it. When I turn professional, understand I'm a product and I'm a business and I'm the paymaster. So everyone dances to my tune because without me, there is no game. And I understand that when you go pro, it's all about business. It took me a long time to learn that, but when I look back now, that's exactly how it is. As an amateur, these coaches don't owe me nothing. They're here to help me progress. They're here to make better men, better women, just make better people. And the time and the sacrifice and the dedication they take away from their own personal and family lives is, is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It really is. So very... I'm of the exact the same opinion. I see what, what these do. Very fortunate. Maybe lads, oxygen, karate. Oh, coasting carbon and different gyms and mm. stuff like that myself so it's, it's, I totally understand you just give so much time Mark mm. it, it's unbelievable like I was so fortunate to come across Jimmy when I did uh, yeah 100% he was just a massive massive factor uh, the amount of lives that man saved from that, them, them gym walls and you know when I look back I always remember my dad talking about that area and the stuff the, the wars that were going on at the time with the people that were living in that area on the, on the certain estates they were living in shooting stabbing stuff like that going on and then when I actually look back there was lads and even when I started working on the door there was lads who were, who were at war with certain people from who I was working on the door for but when you went in that gym everyone was safe because it's the respect everyone has for a boxing gym. And that, that respect is put in place and put it in, into, into the place by Jimmy Albertina. And that and that speaks that I can't speak any greater volumes than that for him. He makes everyone respect the gym and respect each other. Uh, I wish, you know, he could have been here longer with us because what a fella he was. Hilarious, funny. Uh, he cared, but he never told us he cared. Mm -hmm. That's the mad thing. Like I always wanted to impress him. And he never ever told me he was impressed. Everything the the best compliments I got off him was that was shite, that lad. And you think his method of coaching is what brought out the best because you were seeking that like she was a strong male validation. Role model and you you know, I can understand that through I had Colin Eden. You know, Colin Eden's like mama, you either love him mm. or you rate him, he's not the coach for everyone. Mm. But he's certainly capable of bringing out the best of people. Best in you. A lot a lot of the things I'm grateful for from fighting were taught to me through Colin. He taught me that I could do things which I'd tell other people what we were doing in our gym at the time and they, you'd see, they'd think you were lying. Yeah, I'd tell them how many rounds of sparring, what we're doing, what the training was like, what our training involved. Mm. And people would look at you either like you were stupid for doing it mm. or you were lying. Yeah. But basically what he taught me is that you, you, you're capable of so much more than what you actually think you are. Yeah. Because he wouldn't give you a choice. He'd say we're sparring 10 five minute rounds. You wouldn't question it. Mm. You'd spar the 10 five minute rounds. But if, you were to be with anyone else and they say, look, what do you think? Oh, Spadden's on five minute rounds. You'd be like, it's on five minute rounds. You must be mad. With what, 15 second rest in between? And you think like, he just pushes so much. And again, you very rarely got a compliment out of him. But if mm. you did get one, it meant the world to you. Yeah. It did for me, you know. He, he was like a, a, say a role model. I won't say a father figure. Yeah. But he definitely played a big part in me becoming the person who became and taught me, taught me a lot about myself. Mm. Um, so I think it's important, isn't it, for kids? Massive. Well, I advise every every parent, pretty much every every adult, every parent, get your kids into some form of martial arts. Definitely. Or some form of boxing. <clears throat> Especially if they're, they're struggling with discipline and mm. sacrifice and respect because it will teach all of them massively and it will advocate them all as well. So, you know, I know you're going to be thinking, I'm not going to say, like, listen, I'm not going to sit here and lie. And, I don't, and my kids aren't going to the boxing gym. Like I don't put them in there because they're being taught respect and, and discipline all at home. Uh, and I haven't been punched in the face for 20 years to watch my son get punched in yeah. the face. And it absolutely frightens me. But at the same time, they do do pads with me in the house. I take them on the pads. They do do circuits and sessions. So they're getting from me what they get in a boxing gym. I just don't want my kids to go into a boxing gym because imagine the pressure that's heaped on them straight away. You know, that's Tony Bell, you son, and you know, they yeah, expect yeah. this, they expect that. Kids don't need that pressure. They don't need to see that side of it. Uh, as long as they can defend themselves, which they definitely all can do, uh, and and they all stay as healthy as possible, which they all are, then there's no need. But there is a place for everyone in a boxing gym and stuff like that. 
as long as you don't want it to go too far. Like my my greatest fear would have been my kids going in and getting the bug. Dad can have a bout. Okay, yep, yeah, you have a bout. Dad, can I just go to the championships? <clears throat> See how good I am. Once they go in the championships, you've lost them. That's it. You go in the championships, that, that's exactly how it come for me. Uh, and, and boxing got me. I had that one. To be fair, it got me with the one bout. I mean, my first bout was against Rob Beach. Uh, Rob, what was it? Was it Rob Beach? Yeah, Rob Beach at uh, the Heighton Suite. And, and I'd done him in the third, second or third round. I was hooked from then on. Nothing else within life was for me. Mm. I don't want my kids to have to go through what I've gone through. I've gone through torment and sacrifice and heartache and pain and with just that focus and dream of wanting to achieve that goal. I just, all I want for my kids is I'm not expecting rocket scientists. I'm not expecting brains to Britain because the mother and father definitely aren't that. So we're not going to pass on them kind of genes. But what all I want them to be is happy. Happy. Uh, okay, so what's happy? I say to you, Tony, what's happy you mean? Obviously, again, everyone, based on their own perspective, has got a different mm-hmm. version of what happy is. What's happy? Happy is living on my terms. Happy is having the time and the space to be able to do the things I want to do. Happy is seeing me kids happy. That's what ultimate happiness is, seeing me kids and me missus happy. The, the things that make me the happiest in the world is, is, is making them happy. Yeah, it's mad because I, I don't... And considering what you've achieved and you've got all these material yeah. things, you've got pretty much everything you could ever ask for externally. Yeah. When I ask you that question, the first thing what comes to mind is freedom, family, mm. your kids, mm. it's all these things, what we're blessed with, what? What are free? You know, what are free, yeah. I just, it's mad because I don't, I don't look at making myself happy anymore. Uh, I don't think about what will make me happy no more because I feel like, you know what? I've been that selfish for that long. I achieved my goals. I've seen my dreams through. I see them when I close my eyes. I've seen it. I've done it. So you've won world titles. Mm-hmm. Done a, a, an amazing amateur career. Mm-hmm. As a boxer and an athlete, there's not much more Tony Bellew. Nothing. Could have achieved and you're yeah. more than happy. Oh, without uh, doubt. You know, with, with how far, with how far, with the, you know, basically you've reached your potential. Yeah. And, and I think it's safe to say that you don't feel there's any more you could have done. No. Um, well, what happens after that? Because I know you've got, I'll use, I always use Ricky uh, Hatton as an example. No, oh, yeah. So you win your world titles, you've achieved everything. Oh, like Sir Conor McGregor now. <sighs> Needs, wants, absolutely nothing. Money, fa- you know, kids are sorted. Mm. Futures secure, kids are secure. Mm. And ev- ev- materialistically, ev- what we've ever aspired them. Maybe at one point we defined as being successful and making us happy, you've got yeah. it all. What do you do now? You wake up, you've won your world titles. You know, that, that's the hard What do you get out of bed for, basically? That's that's the question. To what gets a, Tony out of bed? To make a difference, to do something productive, help people. I actually enjoy helping people. Was there a period of time after you'd come away from fighting, knowing that you were done? Yeah. You know, where you felt lost or... I was just getting fatter and fatter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's basically I, your purpose is gone, isn't it? Yeah. As I a def- fighter or, def- or any athlete at that level, your purpose and your reason why you get up every day. I is definitely to- believe I was put on this earth to fight. Whether it was to entertain, I don't know. I might have created that part myself. But I was definitely put on this plan to just fight. Because I feel like I've been fighting since I was born. Everything, it's just on everything. Nothing comes fight. easy, does it? No, nothing. Anything worth keeping doesn't come easy. Mm-hmm. That's where and we live in a world at this point now with even happiness. Fucking health, everything comes at a cost. Okay. The system, what we're, we're a part of, what we're it's born possible. into, mm. basically depending on where you live and your parents and your background. Mm. You know, this whole system, economical structure, fucking health system, all of it. It's one great big system what we live in mm. is designed. In, you know, I say in my opinion, but the, this is not through me. It's a fact. Just, it's a fact, yeah. Mm. Designed to make you sick. Designed to take all your money off you and leave your skin, living mm. in stress and things like that. All these certain things to get to the point where you are now and to basically be happy comes at a cost mm-hmm. and you've got to work for it. It's not something that comes easy, is it? No. It's mad to think that everyone in life is up. Every, and this, it, the world that we live in is so negative now and, and portrays so much negative stuff and hate towards other people. But 
I was listening to something the other day, and, and if you think about it, everyone in this whole world, every single person is up from where you came from. Came into the world with absolutely nothing. Well, over 95% of your personality, there's loads of different statistics, but they say less than 5% of who you become is is down to your DNA, basically your genetic, your mm. genes, your genetic makeup. 95 plus percent of it is to your environment. Mm. So that's what I'd mentioned at the start of the podcast over when you said over something you say a lot, that I'm a product of my environment. 100%. And, and we actually are. Mm. Like we recently spent a bit of time doing a workshop in a prison, didn't we, with lads. And yeah. You can meet the lads in there and you see that they're victims to basically the where they society. grew up, to the postcode or the yeah. area what they lived in or the parents and, you know, even the grandparents, the parents before that. Mm. It's, it's, it's a massive thing, isn't it, that we can try and do the stuff, what you're doing with the likes of Weapons Down, yeah. even like the stuff I'm doing with the I Am Project and numerous people all over the city now are stepping up and doing things to try and create positive role models mm. and change the perspectives of these kids in this, in in Liverpool. So. It's all changing the mindset. That's the most important thing, changing the mindset. People, as I said before, we everyone in life feels like that. We came into this world nothing. We came into the world naked and screaming. So from there on, you're up. Whether you've got a pound in your pocket, whether you've got a pair of trainees on, you've got something on you. Yeah. And you've got and you've got something in your pocket. But you might not have nothing in your pocket, but you've got a pair of clothes on. So you're up from when you were born. From the day you're born, your environment creates something what you call a worldview. So it's how you view the world, basically. Mm. Especially early on. I was speaking the first seven years. Mm. But that creates your belief systems and how you perceive the world to be. And then that governs your thoughts. Your thoughts, you obviously control your emotions, how you feel. Your actions and your words are only an expression if you go all the way back to what you believe to be true. So that's why when I've watched you from afar for so long, even as a friend, but I've still stood back and watched and seen it's your belief, your self-belief, mm. which is responsible. Obviously, again, you've worked your fucking socks off, but you wouldn't have done that if you didn't have that insane belief mm. in yourself and had that in a knowing that. It was done. Where Everything what you've ever set out and worked towards, it was done before you'd actually achieved it. If you get me. I know what you're saying because of the belief I've got inside Isn't of me. the belief what you've got, yeah. But it's just, so much, I think I think all of us have a belief to a certain stage, but it's just how much you're willing to follow it. And how much yeah, you're willing and I think to a lot of false beliefs are pushed onto kids and onto people in general. Yeah, definitely. These people's days. fears. People think, oh, because I couldn't do it, you couldn't do it, not at all. Well, that played a big part in me walking away from fine at 27 years of age. I was, fe I feared failure mm. and feared what everyone would think of me if, I didn't reach my potential or I didn't become, you know, a successful uh, fighter. Mm. And that ultimately, I had genuine excuses. I had no money um, and we were struggling financially. And I'd had a son who I didn't want to spend three, four months of the year in different countries away from oh, training. Mm. And I, I used them excuses. Now, you could say the valid excuses. But for me, when I see what the likes of yourselves gone through and I'm seeing the likes of Molly, even Paddy and other people, that until people who've got to certain levels now, Mm. They've had all the excuses, but they've chose not to use them. Mm. And really, for me, that that's the that the side and factor in. Like I, I watch Molly. Molly's a friend of mine. I watch Molly, and I welled up watching mm. Molly when she fought in London because I've seen what that girl's gone through to get to where she is today. Mm. I've seen. I've had. I'm obviously fortunate enough to have you as a friend and watch your journey from back in the Canny Farm days. Yeah, and I'm very very grateful to see that. And at the same time, it's made me realise that. The one thing that held me back was I did not have that belief. Now I had the ability, physical, technical, I trained with the best people in the world. And I give it 100%. Where I everything was spot on. The only box I didn't take was that self-belief. And that's the reason why this podcast and things like that are going on now. The stuff what we're doing in the schools. I believe that the biggest gift you've got to teach people is, as an example yourself, mm. is that self-belief can take you as far as you, you're prepared to believe and you can go. Basically, don't let other people's opinions of you determine how far you can go in life. I actually think you had the belief in yourself, but you definitely because you worked hard enough. I think your thing is you chose to put MJ first. It was definitely a part of a the decision, thing. but at the same time, I spent I spent a good few years being skint and yeah, had to borrow money at certain times, which would have been the same if I'd have pursued a fight career. I'd have, I'd have spent a couple of years being skint, yeah. but I'd have potentially made a lot more money from fighting. Mm. If I'd have reached my potential and what I have through different businesses and stuff like that. The thing it taught me is once I realised that I'd made that mistake, you could call it at the time, mm -hmm. not a mistake. 
in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. But once I realised I'd made that mistake and what I'd, I'd self-sabotaged mm. and stepped away from something which I actually loved, I found what I loved mm. and walked away from it when I'd worked 10 years towards reaching a certain point. And I chose to step away from it. And the only reason I had all the excuses, but self-belief in me trumps every excuse in the book. And you're proof of that. You've had all the excuses. You could have went down a different road. You could have oh. chose a different path, but it weren't an option for you. No, and I've seen the same for Molly and I've seen the same for other people in the city. You've done amazing things. Do you mm. know what I mean? Yeah, I'd say I don't have no option because I've got them kids. And that's the top and bottom. That's the truth of it. So I have them to thank as much as I have myself and Rachel as well. So yeah, without them, I def I'm not gonna lie. I definitely go down other paths. I definitely do other things and, and, and in whatever way you can. But but with them, I don't allow myself to do that because purely once again, you're, you're the product of your environment. I don't want to go down the environment where I come from. I don't want to meet that. I don't want my kids to see me in a place where they shouldn't have to see me. Mm. I don't want them to go through what I've gone through. And I think that's a massive thing. That's say we say product of environments and it can be used in a lot of different ways and terms and to get the points across. But that was the, the defining fact for me wanting to stay away from where I've come from. And that doesn't mean I've come from a bad place because I haven't. I've come from a loving home. I've got a lovely mother. I've got a loving father. The two of them doted on me as a kid. They loved us very much. Just because my dad leaves doesn't make him a bad father. He's a brilliant father. Just not a very good fucking husband, but he's a very good father. Uh, as for my mother, a loving mother who would have done, you know, everything for the children. But uh, my environment and the what I, what they 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 project onto me what I wanted to be, what I am now. They project down to me. So I wanted to my kids that have that stable home of two parents. I want them to see two loving parents being together for the rest of the days. So that is my greatest goal and that is my mission these days. I want my kids to see the moment there's the mum and dad, the Mr. and Mrs. They're married. They're not divorced. They stay together and, and they, they get through anything. And and I, I'm not gonna sit here and lie and project that I I, I live the perfect life because I don't. Yeah, of course I do wear that in loads. You know, going to play golf at a whim just doesn't doesn't sit well for four or five hours at a time. Uh, going missing, going to work, doing this, doing that. But you know what? I'll never ever leave it. I'll never give up on it. Uh, and, and I'd like I'd like to hope she'd do the same thing for me. But once again, it comes back to that's what I'm trying to instill on your own kids. Yes, the, the, the same me time, and the family. No the same as so many other people from Liverpool. Mm. I didn't have the perfect upbringing or what yeah. you'd look at from the outside as the perfect upbringing, but for the position I am now and for feeling so blessed, I mean, I don't need anything. And mm. That's the truth. No, I don't mean that in a bragging way or no. I get up every day and there's nothing personally you need. I need. Yeah. yeah. So f- but happy. I didn't have a dad for 18 years where he wasn't around and mm. he fell victim to drug abuse and things like that. So mm. no, there'll be hopefully people out there who can, Related to the fact that my dad taught me everything I needed to know in terms of spending time with my kids is the most valuable thing in the world to me. Yeah. Because I had a mum who was out working to survive. Mm. So she couldn't give me all of attention. She gave me all of her love, mm. but she couldn't give me all of attention. And she had me two days before her 18th birthday. So she's actually 17 when she had me. So she's only a baby herself. Mm. When I see kids who are 17, 18 now, and I think, wow, that's how old my mum was when, it's crazy. when I was born. It's like, no, she's, she's done absolutely amazing. I couldn't ask any more of her at the same time. Yeah. Obviously, the experience as well I've gone through have helped me learn how not to be in, mm. in a lot of ways through the stuff what my dad had to go through. I've never touched a drug in my life. Mm. That's through lessons what my mum taught me based on being honest Pretty with me and dark. explaining to me never go down that road. And I'm blessed enough mm. that I'm being guided to the point I'm at now. i never done that. I'm not, I see that in my own kids. They're the same. I'm fully confident they'll never smoke. Yeah. No, I, I'm not saying they'll never drink, but I don't believe they'll ever be big drinkers. Or you see all these fucking kids now are smoking vapes. Yeah. Which I try not to let it drive me mad, but I, I feel like slapping them out of the mouth and going, what are you doing? What are you playing at? You what are you playing at? Yeah, yeah that's I'm the same with 11, the 10, 11 year olds smoking with and on vapes. Like it's like the cool and they're absolutely not. And it's like, you know, you can look at the things in your past as well and use them as lessons how to not be and how to, to be better in yourself. But, Defo, I say there's so many things that you can pick up on these days, but the one thing that I'll tell anyone watching this now is 
don't worry too much about finances and financial things in life. The most important thing that we all have and everyone gets the same amount of it is time. Mm -hmm. Because once it's gone, and at the same time, you, you've got to have the, the belief that if you find someone you love and you put that much time and effort into it, you'll earn money anyway. Money yeah. will come. Don't focus on the money. Focus on the passion, putting the work in. And one 100%. way or another, your bills will get paid. And, you, you know, if you've got kids, they'll get yeah. fed and clothed. And That's it. It's all that matters. Mm -hmm. You know, just just spend time with the people that you love. Uh, spend more time on uh, with the people that you love and less time on social media because social media isn't real. What we're doing right now, this is real. We're sitting mm -hmm. here, we're talking to each other as human beings. I can get on my phone and talk to nearly a million people through social media or platforms. It's not real. Okay. It's not real. Before we wrap it up, I've got a few questions, funny Go ones. On. Go on. Are you spiritual or religious or what? I know we have a laugh, don't we? Because you say <laughs> Rachel's into all these fucking crystals and the load Gypsy of bollocks. Jane. And <laughs> Gypsy Jane, yeah. So I have the certain conversations, me yeah. and... Rachel probably have more to love. relate to than, than what me and you do, but at the same time, I love the both of you. So. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know to answer. I, I, I wish I knew. I, to be honest, I wish I could believe in something. I, I want it. Something like you said before was regarding coincidence. I personally believe there's absolutely no such thing as coincidence. Mm. Everything just happens the way it happens and it leads you where, where, you go. where you're supposed to be. I don't um, know. So the answer to that is I don't know. I want to. I want to, but I just don't know. I don't know what I believe. I'm confused. I've been confused all my life. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. what well, I'll tell you what I do believe in. I believe in, well, no, I don't know if I believe in that anymore. I say good things happen to good people, but no, because I've lost people who are good people, so, like, really good people and they've died and they're not here no more. So I don't know if I do believe in that. And a part of that is, is a big, is a big massive factor. So yeah. But at the same time, something else, what you've said through the conversations being, you get out whatever you put in. So oh, there's yeah, things which are laughing, which are out of your control and it may not ever make sense. Mm. But at the same time, if you're willing to put 100% into anything, it's well, actually it, called the law the cause and effect or karma or whatever you want to call it. What was the options you just gave me? But was it belief or, or almost, not? I don't believe in religion, but what was the other Spirituality. one? Spirituality. Yes. Spiritual. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Well, what, what that's what, what everyone. A lot of people have a different perspective on it. Sp spiritual basically means you, do you believe there's more to life than actually us sitting here. Do we go somewhere? Do we come from somewhere? Where do your thoughts come from? I asked this to kids in the schools, and they say the brain. No, your thoughts are not coming from your brain. Your brain tells you to breathe. They're not your thoughts. Your brain actually just interprets your environment. But where, where your thoughts are in your heart. Your thoughts are in your heart. Mm. And that's true. And for me, I think the likes of you, you found your path. Your path was boxing and fighting. That's who you are. It's only Bill you found who he is. Mm. And eventually I found who Mark Scanlon is and I'm living, being who I'm being every day. Mm. And for me, that's why I'm happy and I know you're happy. For My message for a lot of people out there is the more disconnected you become to yourself, and we've had this mm. conversation, haven't we, as friends? Yeah. The more disconnected you come, the more you try and fit in, the more you try and be like other people, you actually disconnect from who you were, who you were born. And I believe that's a big cause behind all the drug abuse, the addiction, people trying to escape themselves through these uh, mobile phones, through TV and all these different things. But I can't stress the value. And you were blessed enough to figure out what you're good at, that's on what you're loving. You've only got to look at where you are now with a testament to you actually you know, whether you realised it at the time or not, I've, this is my belief and I've watched you do it. You've figured out what you're good at, you've loved it and it's given you everything you've ever needed. And mm. that can be anything for you, it was boxing, for, you know, it's individual to the person. 100%. The more you can connect and figure out, this is mainly advice that especially young people today, if you can figure out who you are and what you love to do and you can not give a shit what anyone thinks and you pursue it and you give it 100% exactly the same as Tony has, you can literally take it as far as you're prepared to go. I quit something at 27 and that's the reason why I'm here speaking and trying to share this message today because I learned from it and I didn't let it affect me in a negative way and it's given me everything I've ever wanted. I am a successful person, but I did fail at something and that, that again, that, that's a big part of, you know, we what's, all help, fail. what's helped that's me a lot. Just because you fail at something does not mean you're yeah, a failure. Of course. Um, we all um, fail at something. There is no, there is no progress in life without failure for anything. We can't progress until we fail.
mm. because we the, we learn from the mistakes. It, it's just you will not get better until you fail or you lose one or the other, whether it's a loss, whether it's a fail, whatever you want to call it, but we will not get to the final destination until we come across one of them paths. It all depends on how you respond to a fail or a loss is what defines what exactly what you are. And are you willing to give uh, in? Donna Stevenson. Oh, mate. Yeah. Probably one of the, low, the, the lowest, lowest points point. in your life. Lowest point in my life without shadow of a doubt. Are you willing to give in? Are you willing to, to give up hope? And I, I could have easily just give up then. I gave it 10 years of my life. 10 years of my life uh, and I was skint. 10 years of my life, la. I've just flown over to Canada thinking I'm going to become the next light heavyweight champion of the world. For the, the belt I'd chased and chased, I'd fought final eliminators, fought all around the country, beat number one contenders, done the lot. And then at the final step, I lose. And I lose drastically as well. It's not just any loss. I get stopped, I get beat up. Uh, yeah, and I well and truly get beat up. But you pick yourself up at the floor, didn't you? You dust yourself down, you go <clears> again, mate. You just dust since then accomplished everything in boxing you possibly could. Yeah. Being in Hollywood and movies. Yeah, nuts. Writ a book. Yeah. Being on TV shows. Yeah. And all these more stuff coming up, more plans. Yeah, there is more stuff. Uh, You're I'm doing sure. the weapons down, the gloves up. You're having a big impact on kids and, and youth and basically being a role model mm. just through being yourself, which is... Along with David Hughes, I'm, as I said, we're yeah. trying to make a difference to kids and David does massive things. Uh, we're just trying to make a difference as you're doing with Awake and, and, and with all your stuff that you do now with the I Am Project. It's just, I think we all see the need. The, it's mad because the older you get, the more the more chance you get to reflect and look back and, mm. and also just chill out a bit and go, this is what kids need. Yeah. This is what they just need a little bit of help and hand. We're at that stage now where we can give these kids. There's a one bit thing of time. fighting give me being in, in different countries and spending a lot of time on my own, which I actually enjoy a lot. It gives me a chance to step back out of this whole game and the system what we're in yeah. and see if what it is. And and you know, we're all capable of creating our own financial systems, our own health systems. Mm. And basically what you said, living living life on your own terms. Mm. And and if Tony can do it. You know, oh, mate, if I can do it, anyone He's the first it. person to say, if I can do it, then... Anyone can do anyone it, Anyone can I'm do it. And, you and I know what, I massively respect you for that because for what you've achieved, and I know you find it hard taking a compliment. I've got goosebumps now. You've inspired me so much over the oh, years. Thanks, mate. And I can't thank you enough. I've got two more questions. Okay. Ice baths, meditation, cold showers, <laughs> breath work. It's all the rage at the minute. So okay. I've been doing for a long, long time before it was cool. Mm. What's your views on all these people going and doing... I haven't figured out the breath work yet. You're going to teach me that. So I've got to learn that. But ice baths and stuff like that, I've been doing them for a long, yeah. long time. Uh, I still have a Finch farm. Uh, well, still do Will you ever meditate? Farm. I don't know exactly what it is. I, I tried to, didn't I, when we were in the, the, the prison doing the thing. You want to fell asleep? So uh, Felt nice though, didn't it? It did feel absolutely yeah. fantastic. Uh, like I, I literally tried, I was snoring. Hmm. So Gary was next to me. Went, he can't be snoring. You went, lad. Where I explain it? meditation is meditation is the equivalent. It's someone tell me massively over the last ten years. I've got a really close friend, Martin Bone. If you want to learn about meditation? It's a up. But meditation is basically the, the mental equivalent of what we do in the gym every day for our physical body. It's training your mind. It's teaching you to concentrate, to focus, to direct your attention at things what serve you, to gain control, or to understand the type of thoughts what we have in general. So I can't recommend meditation enough, the cold water, all these different things. I'd love to do that, that meditation I'll be pulling stuff. Tony in my back garden soon and dragging him in an ice bath. <laughs> ice baths, I can put up with all day. <clears throat> I, 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 it's the least I, I should put up with and deserve. But yeah, the cold never, ever bothers me. I'll get an ice bath, mate. I'll, I'll out see anyone in an ice bath. doesn't bother me, I have to say. I used to go into Finch Farm and that's an ice bath that's moving. So it constantly keeps taking the layer off your body. So when you get in an ice bath, as you know, once you've been in it for about 90 seconds, two minutes, your body forms an insulation layer around it and the cold stops hitting you. Yeah. When you go to somewhere like Finch Farm and it's a, it's a therapy. It's flowing. It's a flowing pool. That cold feels like it is. The mm. first minute till the last minute. And mate, I've sat in there for 20 minutes. Just sat there with my whole body and the players yeah. used to get in with just the legs for like four minute periods. I have sat in there for 20 minutes just to push myself one time. I had to get out because they said you're going to end up killing them. I'm villains. not getting you to that. Then we probably both end up fucking in <laughs> dead. <laughs> <laughs> Blocks of ice fucking dead, yeah. He said, he said those who can stay in longest. He said it's nerve ends. No, I won't. I'll just set a time, put it on a time and then I'll just get yeah. out. But no, it's a... Uh, 
and ice baths don't bother me and because I've been that used to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the cryotherapy chambers are tough. I've never done a cryotherapy, but I've done ice baths for I've years. I've done them at Finch Farm. So we've got one at Finch Farm and you go in this little enclosure and mate, it, it's cold. It's like really cold. Like you've got to have, like I went, I remember the first time I went in, I thought, you've got to put gloves on. So I'm don't be stupid lad. Forget the gloves are for the girls. Winding them up. And I was like, put your shoes on. So I put the shoes on things on and I put the gloves on. Well, I, I took the glove off at the start and it come on and I swear to God, my fingers went like frostbite. So I just stuck the glove right back on. I thought, I'm not having this. <laughs> <laughs> Fingernails are going to drop off. But uh, yeah, you go in somewhere like that and it's like minus like two. Yeah, and all the work. It's just, I understand it's, the science, and all the work. So all the players get in there nowadays, but I mean. But there's just something different about getting in a bat or a fucking a wheelie bin or. Yeah. I actually bought a proper ice bath now, which is one of the best investments I've ever made, to be honest. I love it. I love it, yeah, it's part of... How often do you do it? Every day I've been in this morning. Um, See, the, just, just the ice baths just don't bother me. Once the first two minutes, once the first 60 seconds... Yeah, you're a fucking caveman, aren't you? So, <laughs> it's just Sam. Do you know what I mean? But I, I'd love, love to do the breath work thing. You yeah. can teach me that. Um, Meditation. Or mental fitness. I just don't know if my mind ever switches off. Like I, I didn't sleep well last night. I woke up four or five times. That's like saying I'll never do a run because I can't. <laughs> my mind was at it, but the I'll try. You learn, the only way you learn is to practice and repetition, which you know. But I can imagine that'll be very hard for me to practice and switch off. Okay. But I'll try. The last one then, everyone knows, if you follow me on Instagram, I love a good quote, don't I? Quote? A quote, yeah. I absolutely love a good quote. What's my quote? Have you got a favourite quote? Is the yeah. end it's the end of what comes to mind straight away. Fail to prepare, prepare to fail. That's the one. Couldn't have said it any better. That's me quote. So yeah, I'm going to end it there. Honest to God, I can't, uh, I can't thank Tony enough. Fortunate enough for him to actually be a friend and I do get to spend time with him. Not as much as we probably like with his busy schedule these days and obviously the <sighs> stuff I've got going on, but for him to come here and give me a couple of hours of his time and me actually knowing what he has going on with the weapons down, with the stuff he's got to do with the box and the business, his family, I massively, massively appreciate it. It's um, an absolute pleasure. Thank you to Liverpool that. Podcast Studios as well for uh, giving me all the help I need today on my first ever podcast. There will be another one coming soon. And uh, yeah, just thank you for tuning in. Tune uh, in, listen, and yeah. keep following him. He uh, has more knowledge and more stuff in that mind than he could possibly explain in today's podcast. So keep watching and keep educating yourselves, especially the youth as well out there. Us older ones with these grey ears, we tend to uh, <laughs> not absorb it as quick. You younger ones can mm. absorb it twice the speed we can and can put it into play and into motion and make a big difference. So keep listening. Let's go, champ. <laughs>